Good morning and welcome to another week of World History One. Today's lecture is going to be on early Africa and Islam, and then we'll have a second lecture in another video about the Middle Ages. So let's start with Africa here. Um, first of all, Africa is really big. I know that sounds pretty simple and pretty easy to understand, but I really want you to realize Africa is big. First of all, Africa is a continent, not a country. There are some people out there who think of it as a country. No shame if that's one of, if you're one of those people. But just know that Africa is a continent. It is 12 million square miles. You can fit most of the US, China, India, Mexico, Europe, Japan, you name it within this continent. And I have here a picture just to, to try and give you the visual image of how big it is. There are also a lot of people that live in Africa. It's somewhere around 1.25 billion people that live in Africa. Now, some of this is review. Uh, Africa, we've been talking about it basically since the first week. Um, it's thought with the out of Africa origination that's proposed by biologists, historians, and anthropologists, that early humans came from the savannas, the grasslands of Southern and Eastern Africa. These early humans were hunter gatherers. They had to find everything. They had to forage for all their food. And if you remember, the agricultural revolution is fairly new. About 10,000 years ago is when people finally started to grow food and settle down. That began in the Middle East, Mesopotamia, near the Red Sea, and then it spreads to the south and to the west from there. And the primary crops that were grown were sorghum, millet, and then bananas, and sugarcane, and coconuts are all brought into different parts of Africa. Africa is also the site of ancient Egypt. We did a whole lecture on that, so I'm just going to give you a couple of slides. I remember the first settlements in Africa along the Nile River are going to start around 5200 BC. And the settlements are going to grow along the length of the Nile River until they basically have spread the entire length of it by 3500 BC. All this population growth led to conflicts, and then these small cities begin to unite, then they unite and unite, and then you have the upper and the lower kingdoms. And then remember, Narmer is going to unite the upper and lower kingdoms into kingdom of Egypt. Now ancient Egypt, just another refresher, it's broken in, into the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom. The old kingdom is where most of the religion is figured out. The middle kingdom, that's what happens after the Hyksos are going to attack and take over. And then the new kingdom is going to occur once the Hyksos are defeated, and that's where we get Amarna, and that's where we get Aton and Tutankhamun and all those figures. First temples are built around 3500 BC. That's when the religion begins. And remember, their religious figures are Ra, Amun, Toth, Osiris, all of those people. There's a form of writing that is developed in ancient Egypt called hieroglyphics. Remember, that has three different parts to it, the determinative, the phonogram, and the ideogram. And remember that hieroglyphics are read according to which direction the face is looking. And then we know how to read hieroglyphics because of that Rosetta Stone. Ancient Ethiopia is not something I talk about much, but it was briefly mentioned. Uh, it was originally known as the Kingdom of Aksum. 
for the kingdom of Cush. And it was centered along the Blue Nile. Remember the Nile River splits into the Blue Nile and the White Nile. The White Nile is much longer, but the Blue Nile is where most of the water comes from. And the kingdom of Axum is going to develop into modern day Ethiopia. The kingdom of Axum is one of the first places in the world to convert to Christianity, and that happens in the early 300s. And the kingdom of Axum is going to have a colony that would be in what is today Yemen. And that colony was known as the kingdom of Saba. And Saba, that name lives on today in the Queen of Sheba, if you've ever heard of the Queen of Sheba. So Axum and Saba or Sheba are going to be very close trading partners since one was a colony of the other. Now here we have the Sahara. Now Sahara actually means desert, so don't say Sahara Desert because then you're just saying desert, desert. Um, the Sahara really, really big also. It's going to encompass all or parts of 11 different modern day countries throughout North Africa. And we don't exactly know why the Sahara exists, but we do know that somewhere between 6,000 and 5,000 BC, the land started to dry out. And that's a process called no, known as a desiccation. There are some people that live within the Sahara. It's only a million to 1.5 million people, so it's not very many. There are some cities within the Sahara, but not many. And the most important cities of the Sahara were Timbuktu and Carthage. Now Carthage, we've talked about with the Roman Empire. Uh, it was really the focal point, the main city regarding trade. A lot of goods would come from Europe or into Europe from Carthage. And if they were coming into Carthage, there were these trading routes that went from Carthage down into the desert. This is also going to be the home of several very important and large kingdoms. You've got the Kingdom of Mali, the Kingdom of Ghana, and the Kingdom of Songhai. And the leader of Mali was a man named Mansa Musa who was supposed to be the most wealthy person ever to live. And there are historical accounts of Mansa Musa traveling with a huge caravan from Mali all the way to modern day Saudi Arabia. And everywhere he went, he showered gifts and gave money away to people. Now what about the Eastern and Southern part of Africa? There's a lot of history here, and I, I can't possibly cover it all because it'd be an entire semester course by itself. So just some of the bare minimums here. Uh, first of all, there are two language groups. One is called Bantu, and one is known Khoisan. For the Bantu languages, uh, there are over 450 different dialects of Bantu. Now, some of these dialects are mutually understandable, some aren't. And what I mean by mutually understandable is people from different regions being able to understand each other. Now you find this somewhat in Romance languages. Uh, for example, if you are an Italian speaker or a Spanish speaker or even a speaker of Romanian, you can kind of sort of understand each other. You can get an idea of what somebody is saying, even if you don't know the exact words. If you read Italian, if you read Spanish, it's much closer than it is if it's spoken. So there's that version of mutual understandability, but then there's one that's a little bit more easy to see for English speakers. Uh, for example, the difference between American Standard English and uh, British English. 
it's mutually understandable, but there are some words that are different. Or if you think of yourself trying to listen to somebody from South Africa or New Zealand, that's a little bit more difficult to understand, but it's still understandable. So that's kind of the idea with the Bantu languages is there are people who speak Bantu, but it's different forms of it, or maybe a dialect that's different enough to be considered a different language, but it comes from the same origination. How many people speak Bantu? Uh, there's over 350 million. It's a major language group within the world. Uh, some four-year institutions actually teach you Bantu languages, such as Yoruba. Now, what does Bantu mean? Bantu, that's their word for themselves. It means people. And the Bantu language has this, this device, I'll call it. I know that's not the exact word. If I was an English teacher, that's not what I would use. But there's this, this uh, device, there's this concept called reduplication. For example, in many Bantu languages, there's the word piga, P-I-G-A. And piga means to hit or to strike. And piga, piga, where you duplicate the word, piga, piga means to strike repeatedly or hit more than once. This other language called Khoisan, it is known as the click language. And there's a video in this PowerPoint that I hope you watch where the gentleman demonstrates Khoisan or a, a dialect of Khoisan for people to listen to. Now, depending where in the word the click is, it can have different meanings. I've heard people speak Khoisan. I do not personally know any Khoisan words, but I can tell you Khoisan is a, it's a bigger language group than Bantu is. Khoisan has over 500 million people who speak it. And there are some people out there that can speak both Bantu and Khoisan. Now, Eastern and Southern Africa, even though they are below the Sahara, they're still going to be attached to the rest of the world. A lot of that has to do with trading. The sub saharan oh, sorry, the sub-Saharan African people traded with the Middle East, and then they also traded with India and Asia as well. So Eastern and Southern Africa, even though you would think that they are separated because of the Sahara, they're still very much a part of the world. Africa and ancient Greece had a very close relationship as well. In fact, many of the ancient Greek stories are based in some parts in Africa. Now remember, ancient Greece was split into two different parts. There was the Hellenic and the Hellenistic world. Hellenic, that's the old stuff that Socrates and Plato the Hellenic is Sparta and Athens. The Hellenistic, that's the world of Alexander the Great. So remember, that's the difference between these two. In the Hellenic world, you have, like I said, Africa being the site of many Greek stories. Uh, one such story has to do with the pillars of Heracles. Heracles is supposed to have defeated the Titans. And Gibraltar in Southern Europe and Jebel Musa or Jebel Musa are two mountains that were supposed to be where Heracles held up the world and defeated the Titans. In Morocco, you have the caves of Heracles, which are deep caves, supposedly where Heracles slept before taking on the Titan Atlas. And then we also have, very famously, the story of Andromeda. Now, according to the story of Andromeda, uh, you have Andromeda, who is this beautiful daughter, who was the child of Cephas and Cassiopeia. Cephas and Cassiopeia were the king and queen of Ethiopia. Now, Cassiopeia 
is supposed to say that her daughter Andromeda is more beautiful than all the daughters of Poseidon. Poseidon gets mad and decides to punish Cassiopeia. And Poseidon sends the Kraken to destroy the lands of Ethiopia. Now, to stop Poseidon from being angry, Andromeda is going to be sacrificed to the Kraken. But Perseus just happens to be flying by with his winged sandals. He sees Andromeda and saves her very quickly from the Kraken sea monster. According to the story, Perseus and Andromeda then fall in love. They're married. And they live happily ever after. So that entire very famous Greek story supposedly happens in Ethiopia in Northern Africa. Now in the Hellenistic world, remember, Alexander the Great is going to defeat most of the known world. He declares himself a Greek god, but then he declares himself an Egyptian pharaoh and an Egyptian god. The city of Alexandria, which is founded by Alexander the Great, and may actually be his final resting place too, for all we know, is going to become the center of Greek culture. So Greek culture is centered in North Africa during the time of Alexander the Great. The Greeks are going to adopt the language of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians lived first in the Holy Land and then in Carthage. The city of Carthage was actually a colony of the Phoenicians. And the Phoenician alphabet becomes the Greek alphabet, the Greek alphabet becomes the Roman alphabet, and the Roman alphabet becomes the alphabet we use today. What about ancient Rome? Well, Africa and Rome, very closely related. Remember, Rome and Carthage are mortal enemies. We have not one, not two, but three different Punic Wars. We have Hannibal who is going to march elephants into Europe. And in many ways, Africa is going to be the breadbasket. Africa is going to be where Rome gets its food. Because Rome and Africa were so closely aligned and so important to each other, Rome thinks of the North African provinces as being fully Roman. So some places that Rome took over, you didn't get full citizenship, but Northern Africa was so important to Rome that it was considered part of the city itself. Now, Africa and Christianity, which they also have a very close relationship as well. And I know I haven't talked about Christianity yet. That's going to be in the next video. But Christianity is going to spread throughout North Africa through the first century. And that's going to be done primarily by uh, the Apostle Mark. And within Egypt and Ethiopia, there's this special type of Christianity that's developed called Coptic Christianity. Now, Coptic Christianity is a little different from traditional Christianity in that Followers of Coptic Christianity, they believe that Jesus was a human and then becomes a divine being after his death. Now, traditional mainstream Christianity says that Jesus was born divine, but Coptic Christians say, no, he lived as a regular human and it was the way he died that made him divine. So that's a big difference between the two. One of the earliest Christian thinkers was named Augustine of Hippo. And Augustine of Hippo, um, he's going to write this book called The City of God. And he's going to say that non-Christians are the ones who brought down the city of Rome in the year 410. The second part of this video has to do with the foundation of Islam. Islam was founded in the Middle East, which is technically part of Africa. So let's look at this then. First of all, Islam starts in the city of Mecca. 
The Mecca's this strategically located crossroads of uh, caravan routes. There are these trade routes that go from Palestine to Syria, Syria to Yemen, Mesopotamia to Ethiopia. This is like a big crossroads. Uh, Mecca, it doesn't have a lot of manufacturing. There's not a lot of agriculture. Uh, it's a center. It's a rest stop. It's a place to get a bite to eat and get a good night's sleep before you continue on your journey. And because so many people went through Mecca, it was a pilgrimage center. There were over 360 gods represented within the city of Mecca. As you probably know, the founder of Mecca was named Muhammad. Muhammad was born in 570, and he was orphaned at a young age. He was married to this widow named Khadija, who was very wealthy when he was 25. And sometime in 610, uh, Muhammad goes to a cave on Mount Hira, which is near Mecca, and he's visited by the archangel Gabriel, who proclaims him to be a prophet of God. Now, it's going to take Muhammad several years to be confident and comfortable in what he's been shown by the Archangel Gabriel. And his movement takes off very quickly. In 610, the words of, of the religion are revealed to him. By 750, Islam has spread throughout Arabia, into Persia, the Middle East, North Africa, and even all the way into Spain and Europe. Now, what are the beliefs of this religion? Um, first of all, there's the Shahada, which means one God. There's only one God. There's no trinity. Muslims which is what a believer in Islam is called, believe that Christ existed, but he was another prophet. And Allah, as God is called in Islam, is the same God as Jawa or Yawa in, in uh, Judaism, and Yehovah or Jehovah as in Christianity. It's all the same God. Now, Muhammad is told that he is the fourth and last of the great prophets. Moses, David, and Jesus came before him. Now, before you think that's a little strange, uh, the Shahada, no trinity, there are actually some denominations in Christianity that believe that same thing. Not all Christians believe that there is a trinity. The second item is salat, or prayer. If you are a good Jewish person or a good Christian, you are expected to pray, and it's no different for a Muslim. Uh, the biggest difference between Muslim prayer and that of other religions is that a Muslim is supposed to pray five times a day, and it's supposed to be towards the city of Mecca. Also, each of the five prayers has a different name. We have zakat, which is tithing. Uh, tithing, this zakat, is a tax that all Muslims must pay. It's supposed to be something like 20% of your earnings. And it was thought that this is a loan to God that will be repaid in the afterlife. Yeah. Tithing is commonplace in Christian churches. If you're somebody who gets up early on Sunday mornings, uh, you might know there's a particular point in the Christian service where the organ music starts getting really loud and pretty, and tables are going to be tables, but um, plates will be passed throughout the chairs. That's tithing there. You have psalm or fasting, and this is known as the month of Ramadan. During the month of Ramadan, there's no food, there's no drink, there's no medicine, there's no uh, pleasure of any sort during daylight hours. Once the sun goes down, medications required for the 
for living, some water and certain drinks are allowed. Now there is fasting in Christianity. Uh, maybe you've given something up for Lent before. And in both Christianity and Judaism, there's fasting. That's what Passover is supposed to be. Then last but not least, we have the Hajj or pilgrimage. Every devoted Muslim is supposed to go to the city of Mecca once in their life. In Christianity, once upon a time, you were supposed to go to Jerusalem or Rome once in your life. And in Judaism, you were supposed to go back to Jerusalem there as well. So Hajj, this idea of pilgrimage, while it's a big part of Islam, it's not exclusive to Islam. Now I want you to notice that Jihad, Jihad is not part of Islam. I know there's a lot of talk about that in the last decade or so, but Jihad is not one of the pillars of Islam. Now there are two very important books in Islam. One is called Quran, and that literally means the recitation. Those are supposed to be the words revealed from God by the Archangel Gabriel to Muhammad. It's listed in 114 chapters. It's based on the Torah. The Torah recognizes, or not the Torah, but the Quran recognizes that both the Torah and the Holy Bible are from divine sources. They are the word of Allah, just have varying messages. And really, in many ways, Islam is not a new religion, it's just a different way to look at Judaism. Both Jews and Christians were seen as people of the book or by the book, and therefore they did receive some protection within the Islamic world. The second book is called the Hadith, and the Hadith is going to contain all the records of what Muhammad did. So the Quran are the words as revealed to Muhammad, the Hadith, what did Muhammad actually do with the knowledge he was given. In 622, Muhammad moves to the city of Medina, and this is not a voluntary move. Uh, Medina is about 200 miles north of Mecca, and he was forced to move because there was growing opposition to his teachings within Mecca. Now, this migration is going to become known as the Hijra, and it's the first year of the Islamic calendar. Muhammad stays in Medina from 622 until 630. And in 630, Muhammad and a group of followers begin to attack the caravan headed for Mecca. And Muhammad is eventually going to gain enough strength that he can return home to Mecca with a little army behind him and reclaim all of his belongings. Now, what happens after Muhammad? Well, after Muhammad passes away, the, the Islamic faith is going to go through some changes. When Muhammad dies in 632, he named Abu Bakr, his, who was his closest friend, to be his successor. And Abu Bakr is going to become the first imam or caliph, which basically just means deputy of the prophet. So Abu Bakr becomes a spiritual leader. He commands the real physical army that Muhammad had. He's the head of the growing Arab state that's being created. And he's the supreme judge for the Muslims. And he rules for about two years. And during the two-year period, he imposes unity on most of the Arab people. And the Arab people are forced to follow the religion of Muhammad. 
Now, Abu Bakr and his successors are going to send armies out to claim new territories in Palestine and Syria, and then all the way into North Africa. Now, it is an important distinction to know that they're not conquering in the name of Judaism, or in the name of Islam. Um, this is not a religious takeover per se, but what it is is somebody who has a strong faith in religion. This isn't much different than when Christian armies from the European countries went into non-European countries. They didn't necessarily do it to spread Christianity, although that was part of it. In many ways, they were Christian, so they took the religion with them, if that makes any sense at all. I, I really hope it does. Um, but the important thing is to know that, yes, Muslim armies did conquer the world, but no, they didn't necessarily do it in the name of Islam. There are going to be three branches of Islam that break out and are created. There's the Shiite, the Sunni, and the Sufi. Now, the Shiites, they believe that Ali, who was Muhammad's son-in-law, was the true successor of Muhammad. Now, you might be wondering where Ali comes from. Um, after Abu Bakr, there are a couple of leaders, and eventually we come to a leader named Uthman. And Uthman is going to be assassinated in 656 BC. Once Uthman is assassinated, Ali, who is Muhammad's son-in-law, he comes out of nowhere and says, Muhammad said that I should be his successor. Now, Ali is going to be assassinated himself in the year 661, but by the time he is assassinated, these ideas have started to spread. Ali's followers are going to become known as the Shia. And the Shiites, or the Shia, their main belief is that Ali was the true successor of Muhammad. That meant Ali was the first Imam or Caliph. And they said Shiites should only accept laws and beliefs found explicitly in the Quran. And they also believe that a pilgrimage to Mecca can be done by somebody. Sunnis, they're okay with the thing with the things that were happening. They believe that Abu Bakr was the true successor of Muhammad, and they didn't just look at the words of Muhammad, they looked at both the words and the actions. Meaning they looked at what Muhammad did after he became the leader of this religion, and he tried to spread it passively. And they were very much, what did Muhammad do, as well, as well as what did Muhammad say. Shiites, though, they're based only on what was written down in the Torah, or the Quran, or in the, the Christian Bible. They wanted things followed exactly as they were written down. Now, Sufis kind of mix these two together. Uh, the ultimate goal of the Sufi was to create this union with God or with Allah through love and purification. They're very much into magic and mysticism. And they believe that if you understood Muhammad, the closer you were to Muhammad, the better you would understand God. And that's because God named Muhammad to be the supreme human being that everybody should look up to. Now, there is a little bit of interest or a few things to know about Islamic civilization. First of all, Islamic civilization is big. The city of Baghdad had many, many more people than Constantinople. Constantinople was a city of about 400,000. 
where Baghdad was like 1.5 million people. In Europe itself, the Muslim people built the city of Cordoba. And Cordoba was big for its time. It was one of the largest cities in Europe with somewhere between 400,000 and 500,000 people. It had a central mosque that sat more than 5,500 people. There was a, a, a large group of public bathhouses, more than 900 of them there, more than 1,500 total mosques, and over 100,000 shops. Cordoba also had a very well-known library that had thousands of books. Compare that to your average middle age book holding in Europe, and you're going to find a couple dozen at most in something like a, uh, a monastery. Islamic civilization also built these vast trading networks between Europe and Asia. The Islamic uh, people, they set up what's eventually going to become known as the Silk Road. There is religious toler toleration for Christians and Jews. As long as you pay taxes and follow the rules, they didn't bother you. But those that they called heathens were forcibly converted to Islam. So if you were not Christian, if you were not Jewish, if you were not Islamic, you could then be forced into the Muslim faith. Women were rigorous, rigorously excluded from public life. Uh, they could not be seen out in public. And the Quran permitted men to have up to four wives. Uh, however, you can only have as many wives as you can financially support. The Quran also gave Muslim women the right to control their dowries, their bride price. And that meant that even though they couldn't make money, they couldn't go out in public, they could still use some of their inheritance to get remarried if something happened to their first marriage. Muslims study medicine, science, philosophy, and much of our modern day medicine, much of our modern day psychology, all of that comes from this period of time, the European. All right, last but not least. A lot of ancient knowledge was preserved in libraries. So it's not that just that they studied medicine, it's not just that they studied science, they're the ones that actually preserved it and shared it once the Middle Ages were over. All right, that is all for this video. Please make sure that you watch the video also on the Middle Ages that I'll be putting up, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.